So as we all know, jazz is dying. It's dying, man. But at least we have Loive, the Icelandic Chinese multi-instrumentalist jazz singer and songwriter who is currently dominating the jazz charts. She's very much the Nora Jones of Gen Z. If streams are to be believed, she is the most famous living jazz musician. So we here in the benighted jazz community are so thankful for our new savior, which is unfortunately the narrative that's currently being pushed. And I would like to take the opportunity in this video to very lightly push back on that narrative and put it into some badly needed historical context because it doesn't really do anybody good, least of all, Loewe herself. At the same time, I'd like to talk about how she has very artfully incorporated jazz vocabulary and molded it with a modern pop sensibility. Her music is, you know, very much of the year 2023. She got her start live streaming during the pandemic and posting videos of her performance performing classic jazz standards, developing a fan base along the way. She speaks the language and reference of TikTok culture fluently, like she has an official sped up version of the music video for her bossa nova hit from the start. There are memes, there are fan covers, there are lots of Frank Sinatra AI timbre transfer covers of her music. Don't you know this how? Like this is music very much for fall 2023 and her audience is not really coming from establishment jazz communities. It's young Gen Z who has been coming out to our concerts in droves. But it was like, all of a sudden there were like, you know, two, 3,000 teenagers screaming along to a jazz standard. This is misty. This is pretty remarkable, right? I mean, if you're a jazz musician over the age of 25, like yours truly, you probably haven't seen something like this before, at least I haven't. And I'd like to take today exploring the influences that Loive wears on her sleeve so readily. Let's get into it. This video was brought to you by Sungazer. Come see my band live this fall. More at the end of the video. Part one, what makes Loive jazz? Loive's breakout hit on her most recent album, Bewitched, is From the Start, a breezy bossa nova tune that calls to mind Astrid Gilberto, the Brazilian singer of The Girl from Ipanema. Compare Astrid singing the tune Day by Day to Loive singing From the Start. Day by day, I'm falling more in love with you. Don't you notice how I get quiet when there's no one so we can hear Loewe use a similar orchestration and harmonic palette. She's using 2-5 vocabulary, very much in the vein of jazz and bossa nova music. Both melodies are outlining the interval of a perfect fifth between the third and the sixth scale degrees. And both melodies use a lot of syncopation, a lot of offbeat material, which is very common in Brazilian bossa nova music. But this is just one of the references that Loewe channels. She's very fond of Chet Baker, the trumpet player and singer, who is known for his understated and yet immensely evocative vocal style. Until you flipped your heart and you have lost power. She loves incorporating Chet Baker licks, specifically the bebop vocabulary that he uses during his scat solos. Compare the vocal improvisation from Chet Baker's Do It The Hard Way to Loewe's solo break on From The Start. It's a little different, but you can hear some of the same things, like the arpeggiation to the flat nine on the B flat seven, and that 16th note articulation, the turn. <laughs> But I mean, let's zoom back. That's that's bebop vocabulary right there. And that's an audience of 5,000 in Manila singing it back to Loewe as she scats Chet Baker licks. That's wild. It's Taylor Swift does bebop. What a time, man. I'm like wondering how to make this intro spicy. Incorporating this vocabulary organically in modern pop music seems to be something that she really is passionate about. For example, check out the seven, flat seven, six, flat six, five cadential chromatic line in the underscoring to Sarah Vaughn's Misty. Walk my way too much alters the melody in her own version of Misty and sings the line too much in love with this chromatic line. Too much in love. Many jazz greats have used similar chromatic vocabulary on the tune. Well, 
Loewe has talked about how she generally connects to jazz singers that explore the lower registers of their voices as opposed to belting pop singers. And stars fell on Alabama And stars fell on Alabama now, Loive is a multi-instrumentalist. She got her start playing cello, and she often talks about her classical influence that she got from her violinist mother. And because of that influence, she loves using orchestral timbres that evoke a mid-century studio orchestra aesthetic. Check out the ending of her tune, Must Be Love. <laughs> This is part of a broader trend on how she approaches harmony and harmonizing the human voice to evoke a different era. This is the kind of harmony that groups like the Andrews Sisters or the Four Freshmen use. Pointiana, your branches speak to me of love. This kind of thing is clearly the reference that she used at the beginning of her tune, Dreamer. Let me be a dreamer, let me flow. I can see the whole world from To get this sort of sound, you gotta have four voices singing in closed position within the span of an octave. You take each note in the melody and then harmonize it down using the chord of the moment. If the note in the melody is not part of the chord, you harmonize it with a diminished seventh chord. This is a vast oversimplification of a system that Barry Harris would call a six diminished scale. But Loewe probably picked up this technique from the Berklee College of Music. She went to Berklee, my alma mater, where it's known as mechanical voicings or mechanical voicing technique. You can learn more about it in this book, Modern Jazz Voicings, if you so desire. Now this style of vocal arranging has proven very popular on social media for a number of reasons, I think. The first, of course, is that cell phone speakers are optimized for the human voice and any musical style that features the human voice so specifically is going to be best flattered on cell phone speakers. And social media is normally consumed through cell phone speakers. But the second reason is that it evokes a distant era, the 1940s, and there's a very specific reason why. Between 1942 and 1944, there were no new instrumental recordings due to a general strike organized by the musicians' union trying to get musicians paid fairly. Imagine that happening today, right? No new recordings for the next couple of years until Spotify pays musicians fairly. <laughs> Wow, a boy can dream. Vocalists were not part of the union though, and so could still record. This led to musical innovations. They started singing a cappella arrangements and developing an a cappella style mimicking the popular big band jazz arrangements of the day. Popular jazz big band arrangements which used stuff like these mechanical voicings. Singers mimicked the big band saxophone solis popular at the era and backed up popular up and coming stars like Frank Sinatra. Close to you. When Loewe is using these musical techniques, she is evoking the glamorous culture, or at least perceived glamorous culture, of a previous generation and bringing it to Gen Z. But I don't think I would call her music jazz. Ah, Adam, why are you gatekeeping jazz? It's 2023, jazz can be whatever you want. Sure, but I think there's some very interesting things that can be learned by contrasting what she does with what, say, Ella Fitzgerald did. Because I think that speaks something truer to her music and why she is so popular right now. Part two, what makes Loewe not jazz? Like the most obvious thing is that most of her tunes are original. Live writes earnest lyrics about her experiences as a young woman in the vernacular of Gen Z. Everybody's falling in love and I'm falling behind. Like earnest heartfelt lyrics about your experiences, that's what you would expect from a songwriter, right? But that doesn't happen in jazz. Like ever? She's so perfect, blah blah blah. Oh how I because of that, she has garnered a large fan base of people who would not normally be part of the jazz community. Teenagers, and specifically teenage girls. She's so perfect, blah, blah, blah. Now in jazz education, there is important work being done in bringing young women into playing jazz and making sure that there's a space for them in the jazz community. There is more work to be done, but it is better. However, when it comes to teenage and teenage girl listeners of jazz, consumers of the music, there is in fact an active hostility towards youth culture. When I'm giving clinics, a kid will ask me, what about re relating us? What about appealing right. us? And I have to tell them, look, uh, adults don't appeal to children. Leve talks about this. For young people to relate to music, 
Um, they want to hear music made by people their age. Jazz is a music that I think is best experienced live in a small club. The vast majority of small clubs, you have to be over the age of 21 to enter. TikTok and online spaces are in general just an easier place for teenagers to experience culture. And Leve speaks that language very fluently. And so I think her success comes from her being distinctly not jazz and her approach to music making and connecting with her fans. You know, present it to a young audience and not like repel them the same way that, you know, other jazz musicians maybe. Because of the radically different demographic that Loewe appeals to, I can't help but think that her music and approach bears just the slightest passing resemblance to musical theater. It's like Disney music, right? And I don't mean that in a bad way. There's an important historical reason for this. Large portions of the jazz repertoire come from musical theater and by extension Disney. Like the jazz standards that Chet Baker and Ella Fitzgerald sang were not written by those artists. Instead they were written by like Irving Berlin, Cole Porter, George Gershwin. They were writing earnest love songs using the vernacular of the 1950s. Very much like, you know, Leve is doing today. When you listen to Leve sing, I've never been in love before. But this is it's almost hard to tell if she's being inspired by Chet Baker. But this is why. Or there's a bit of forlorn bitterness in his phrasing. You know. Jazz. Or if she's channeling the original version from Guys and Dolls. Where it feels a lot more earnest and innocent. Trying to separate, like, on a technical level, the difference between jazz and musical theater, although we'll call it mid-century pop for the rest of this video, because that's kind of what it is, because it's not on a stage. Anyway, it's kind of hard. Like, you know it when you hear it, but what exactly is the difference? Jazz music is an important 20th century chronicle of American life set to rhythm and tune. By the 1990s, jazz needed to have like a coherent historical narrative. Like the weight of its importance as American folk music was just too great to ignore, both for like American identity and also African American identity. One of the questions that needed to be answered is, why is Miles Davis doing Someday My Prince Will Come part of this tradition? <laughs> And why is Judy Garland doing Someday My Prince Will Come not part of the tradition? It's the same music, same melody, same harmony. Is it just because Miles Davis is black? Well, that doesn't seem right at all because there are plenty of non-black musicians who've contributed to the culture of black American music. Alongside documentarian Ken Burns, the trumpet player Wynton Marcellus was at the foreground of this discussion in the 1990s, joined also by the polemical writer Stanley Crouch. They came up with three essential criteria for jazz. The first was swing, the rhythmic style pioneered by Louis Armstrong in the 1920s. It's difficult to define, it's not this, it's a little bit more nuanced than that, but it's easy to feel when you hear it. The second was the blues the uniquely American melodic, harmonic, rhythmic, and timbral musical vocabulary that has its origins in North African, West African, British Isles, and Native American music. The history of the blues is wild. Definitely don't have time to get into it today, but that's what the blues is. And the third is improvisation. Improvising your solos in the moment is very important in jazz, and also the collective decision-making that comes when a soloist is interacting with a rhythm section. An ensemble language shows how powerfully people can be themselves and be a collective at the same time, and that's where the real force of jazz comes from. You know, because it, it shows that you can have people making collective decisions and avoid anarchy. I'm sure you nerds won't like how Stanley Crouch is using the term anarchy here, but I, I think you get the sentiment. So Judy Garland doesn't sing Someday My Prince Will Come with any swing. There isn't any blues inflections in how she phrases the lines. And it doesn't seem like there's much improvisation or collective decision making going on between her and the rest of the musicians on the stage. So from this definition, we can say it's not jazz. It's beautiful. It's mid-century pop, not jazz. When Miles Davis does the same tune, he has all three. 
Swing, blues, collective decision making. I'm using this definition, by the way, in a very specific way, because I don't subscribe to it at all. It's incredibly conservative and was primarily used to make sure that jazz fusion was not considered part of the tradition. The problem is, is that there are styles within the tradition that don't fit the definition either. Duke Ellington's orchestra has plenty of tunes where the players just play the music that Duke Ellington and Billy Strayhorn wrote for them. I don't think anybody would say that Duke Ellington isn't part of the tradition. On the other side of that, there are styles of music that use all three, swing, blues, and improv, that I don't think many people would call jazz. The juvenile tiny desk, for example, is hip hop, but man, it it like it swings. There's a lot of blues there. There's a lot of collective decision making. But I think everybody would have to stretch their definition of what jazz is to include it. Unless hip hop is jazz, which I honestly think there is a case to be made. I mean, there are people like Nicholas Payton who say that. We shouldn't call it anything jazz. Jazz died in 1959. It's all just been black American music since then. The alternative here is that this feels very New Orleans. This is very New Orleans music. And so if jazz is just anything that comes from New Orleans, then yeah, this is jazz. Which I think is probably the most honest definition of jazz that we could ever come up with. It's not jazz unless it comes from New Orleans. Otherwise, it's just sparkling blues. So even though I don't really like agree with this definition of jazz, it does a pretty good job of distinguishing people who are playing in the tradition versus people who are doing mid-century pop music. Black American music versus musical theater. So with that in mind, let's check out Natalie Cole singing I Wish You Love with a studio orchestra and then compare it to Leve doing the same song with a similar orchestration. From the store. So you hear in the Natalie Cole, there's the swing, like it's slow. Now on the other hand, Leve's version is played with a pop bossa nova feel, and the eighth notes are straight with accents on the downbeats. It feels great. The orchestra sounds fantastic, but it's not swing. Now it sounds like Natalie Cole is playing with bending the notes and playing with the time a little bit more, parts of blues vocabulary. So listen to that particular bend again, like how far behind the beat it is, how she's shaping the vowel and how she's bending into the note. The pianist responds with blues licks of his own. So there's like a little bit of back and forth going on. On the other hand, Loive does not sing the song with the blues. My very best I said you. She's singing beautifully, but I personally don't hear much blues influence. And while she does take a cello solo, there's no improvised interaction between her and the other members of the orchestra. So, I think on a technical level, she is not doing jazz. She's doing mid-century pop music, which has a very close history to jazz, and it's easy to confuse the two of them, but it's not exactly the same. But Adam, why do you care so much about the genre? Like, musicians are just gonna make whatever they want to make. Who cares about the genre? Stop gatekeeping jazz. Why can't Levy be jazz? And, you know, I, I understand that. I mean, I personally don't consider my own music to be jazz. I consider it to be jazz fusion, which is like a different tradition. It's like the annoying younger brother of jazz. And to answer the question, why can't Levy be jazz, I'm gonna quote my friend Patrick Bartley on this one. If, if you're gonna ask the question, why can't this be jazz? Why does it have to be jazz? Why do you need that word? Patrick's referencing something slightly different here. He's talking about how jazz festivals sometimes just don't have jazz artists on them. It's a great video, go check it out. But I wanna talk about this in a slightly different light. You know, genre is more than just the sound of the music. It's also, at the bottom, the culture and the community of people that make the music and listen to the music and talk about the music. And then also at the top, it's the institutions that promote the music, that market the music, and then present the music in live performance situations. And I think there's a profound disconnect between Loewe and the culture at the bottom and the institutions at the top. Part three, jazz is dying. dying on the fine, and the world says, let it die. It had its time, well, not on my watch. With Loewe's absurd success, there's now a narrative forming that she is the savior of jazz. It's taken for granted that jazz isn't around anymore, and that she is the one who is bringing it back 
for Gen Z. She sometimes contributes to that narrative. Do you think jazz needs saving? I do think jazz needs saving. Although I don't think she intends it that way. I think she's just very passionate about sharing the music that was formative to her. Because Leve's fans are so dedicated and so excited to learn more about her, this narrative is algorithmically amplified. At the time of this posting, there is now a video essay that has over a million views that provides some very lazy and insipid commentary. For decades, no one has succeeded, but Leve did. Because jazz was struggling, but one person beat all the odds. And that's Leve. <laughs> Uh, I don't think this guy, I don't think this guy fully understands the discourse that he has just created. <laughs> oh boy. Because jazz was struggling. On the cover of the State of Jazz playlist here, that's Esperanza Spaulding and Fred Hirsch. Esperanza Spaulding, like Loewe, is a multi-instrumentalist singer. She went to Berkeley, she taught at Berkeley, and was anointed the savior of jazz 10 years ago. I always wanted something more from my body. She won Best New Artist at the Grammys, beating out both Justin Bieber and Drake. Her classical jazz record, Chamber Music Society, was a surprise hit in 2011. She's won five Grammys, she played at the Obama White House, she's closely collaborated with some of jazz's greatest musicians, like Wayne Shorter, for example. Because jazz was struggling. Like, I know this was done out of ignorance, but it is genuinely strange to show Esperanza Spalding, of all people, as an example of failure. You know, but Esperanza is not the only savior of jazz. There have been many others, like a couple months ago, for example. And the Grammy goes to Samara Joy. Samara Joy won Best New Artist at this year's Grammys. She is another young Gen Z phenom, deeply inspired by Ella Fitzgerald and other great jazz vocalists of the past. Samara Joy. She, like Loive, has done the circuit of late night shows and has a beautiful singing voice that seems completely removed from the popular style of today. But most importantly, AI Patrick has covered her work. But you found a girl and your man. Because jazz was struggling. Like, chill out, dude. It can't all be bad because we got this. <laughs> I didn't give to you. Yeah, it's so good. Anyway, the picture of Esperanza Spalding and Fred Hirsch, the pianist, on that picture of the Spotify playlist is a live album called Alive at the Village Vanguard. This is pretty directly a reference to the classic Bill Evans record, Live at the Village Vanguard, the classic New York City jazz venue. Yes, live at the Village Vanguard. And Loewe has talked about how much he enjoys the immersive effect of those records. And you can literally hear like glasses clinking in the background and like forks and knives like scraping like the, probably like against the steak or something against plates. You can hear the same like ASMR approach to the recording that places you in the jazz club with Esperanza Spaulding and Fred Hirsch on their record at the Village Vanguard. Clinks, conversations, which makes this comment by Leve feel just a little bit odd to me. And it sounds so like it really just transports you, just transports you, just transports you. Hold on, wait a second. Transports you to when or where exactly? A different time? A different place? Because, you know, the Village Vanguard never went away. It's still in the West Village. It's still sold out like every night. You can go there right now and experience all the glamour of this music for yourself. And, you know, you don't need to go to a different decade to experience this music. Young people never stopped making it. Better yet, if you're under the age of 21 and you're not in New York City, you can just tune in to Live from Emmett's Place. Welcome to Emmett's Place. How's everyone doing tonight? Live from Emmett's Place is an ongoing live concert series held in the living room of pianist Emmett Cohen's Harlem apartment. The musicians are extremely talented. They play classic tunes, they joke around, and play music steeped in the jazz tradition. It's old music played with modern sensibilities and has garnered a huge following from people around the world first exposed to, in my humble opinion, real jazz. And it's very popular. Viral clips on YouTube are relentlessly watched, studied, and discussed among young jazz musicians. A Life from Mehmet's Place has some very interesting historical context. It essentially started as a modern day 
Rent Party. Rent parties were events held in Harlem in the 1920s with hired live musicians that had the goal of helping tenants raise money to pay for rent. There were very popular social events and had the additional consequence of being breeding grounds for early stride and jazz piano greats like Fats Waller. Now alongside the bassist Russell Hall and the drummer Kyle Poole, just an amazing rhythm section, Emmett Cohen started Live from Emmett's Place as a means of giving musicians work at a time where there was no gigs. A pandemic rent party for the 2020s, but still held in one of the same buildings that would have held one of the historic Harlem rent parties of the 1920s. The unintended consequence of these rent parties is that New York City jazz is exposed for a global audience. This is all happening in Harlem, the center of black American culture in New York City, where so many of the jazz greats have lived and worked, literally around the corner. And because of that, if you're a jazz musician right now, you aspire to play in Emmett Cohen's living room. It's wild how that works. Oh, and yeah, Samara Joy has been on Live at Emmett's Place. A little dinner too. <laughs> You're so mean to me. This is a small, but like a decent cross section of jazz as it exists in 2023, bridging multiple generations with this music. Leve, like from Live at Emmett's Place, is very much a product of the pandemic. She got her start posting videos of herself playing classic jazz standards after being sent home from campus after classes being canceled at Berkeley. When she performs live, she often performs either solo, like in the original videos, or with a band of LA pop musicians. The MD uses an Ableton session running main stage and plays bass with his left hand on a Moog synthesizer. Everybody is on in-ear monitors. When the band members communicate with one another, they do so through talkback mics that are fed through the in-ears. Oh, exactly. I, I realized, I was like, I really am running like a pop show. This is clearly a performance concept designed for rock and pop venues, not jazz clubs or Emmett Cohen's living room. In fact, as she explains, that kind of jazz space is foreign to her. I think the first time I went to a jazz club was the first time I played in a jazz club, like a couple of months ago. They're like these little speakeasy things. They're speakeasies. Yeah. I was like, I don't know, do I have to be 21? Like, it doesn't really like, you know, and... So it seems like Loewe doesn't have much connection to jazz culture. At the other side of this, at the institutional and marketing level, journalists who have reviewed her album have, it seems like without exception, never reviewed a jazz record before, or a classical record for that matter, despite the fact that her album is being marketed as classical slash jazz. These are pop music reviewers. In this world, Leve very much fills a niche similar to that of her contemporary Doty. The interviewers who interview her are largely not covering jazz music. They cover fashion, sports, food, style, but not jazz music directly. Jazz seems to be more like a prestige accessory in these lifestyle interviews. In all the interviews that I've watched and read, Leve and her interviewers never discuss her Gen Z jazz contemporaries, which is strange because because we have another Gen Z jazz phenom that just won Best New Artist at the Grammys, you would think that somebody would think to compare the two even just on a superficial level. And that doesn't really happen. The world that covers Leve is utterly disconnected from jazz at every level. Leve has talked about how jazz is gate kept. Kind of gate kept. Mm -hmm. I think it's something that's really scary for young audiences to approach. It's something that seems like it's only for an older generation or like the, the, the barriers to entry are so high. And I do think that there is a degree of truth to that. Jazz music is very removed from youth culture and Loewe could be a bridge between the two. But I say could because she's alienated from the music, both from the culture at the bottom and the institutions at the top. And as such, Loewe could be a great introduction to classic jazz recordings for Gen Z. She genuinely could bring Gen Z to the wonderful recordings of Chet Baker and Ella Fitzgerald, but she can't bring anybody into what's happening right now because she's removed from it. And I think that kind of sucks because there is a living, breathing culture that's worth talking about. And the world's most famous living jazz musician isn't really part of it. The fear that I have is that Loewe's fans, because they don't have any context, will try to invent an imagined culture from a romanticized past that never was, which is what happens when you're not connected to the culture. Think Wagner inventing those like, you know, horns for Vikings to wear and then that was what we thought Vikings wore, you know? That sort of thing. This is kind of an aside, but I think is relevant to the story. In 2018 and 2019, I flew to Cork, Ireland to play a bunch of bar gigs with a funk band called The Clubs as part of the Guinness Jazz Festival. Guinness Jazz is a jazz festival that has very little to do with jazz, except in maybe the most bacchanal sense of the word. Drinking, chaos, dancing, music for four days straight. It's a wild time. 
the live music is very much not jazz, but hey, nobody cares. I certainly didn't care. It's such a fun time. I had a lot of fun going to like sessions with the Irish musicians. Shout out to Paul Dunlea. I played a random gig with Ariel Posen, which was quite wild. It was a lot of fun. Anyway, wherever we went, there were these like cartoonish nods to an imagined 1920s American jazz culture, like plastic party bowler hats that everybody was wearing, which is very amusing to see next to our trombone player, Kevmo, actually wearing a bowler hat. On the one hand, it is very funny and very appropriate that the Irish would so aggressively parody American culture as an excuse to get drunk. Honestly, bravo, touche. We deserved that one. But you know, like, Guinness Jazz Festival had nothing to do with jazz music, nothing to do with jazz culture. And so people invented a version of jazz that they wanted to get drunk to, like a parody of jazz. When you are removed from culture, parody seeps in. Leve's music is not a parody, is very much honestly connected to mid-century pop music as well as 21st century pop music. But because the discussion around her music is so removed from the culture, there will be an imagined version of jazz culture that's created that I fear will push away the culture that's already there. And so Leve, if you're watching this, I, I, first of all, I love your work. I love your rendition of I Wish You Love. It's such a beautiful tune. And I love the fact that you're getting so many people like pumped about this music that I deeply care about and so clearly do you. But whether or not you want to, you're now kind of the ambassador of American folk music, black American folk music. The only art form Americans have invented that will commend us down through the years to posterity is a music born primarily in a community that has the historical memory of being unfree in a supposedly free land. How do you deal with that? Like, how do you authentically deal with that? And that's something that I, personally, Adam Neely, this YouTube channel, have to think about a lot. And it's something that weighs very heavily on me personally because I'm some privileged white kid from suburban Maryland. And for so many people around the world, I am their first exposure to jazz music. And I treat that very seriously. I haven't treated it seriously before in the past, but more and more as the years go on, I treat that with the respect that I feel like it deserves. I don't get everything right all the time, but I think it's important to always be thinking about the culture from which you, from which you draw your art. And so I would hope that like, I don't know, go to a jazz jam session, like go to a jazz club or something and, you know, sit in, sing Misty or whatever, or I fall in love too easily. Everybody's gonna love you, you sound beautiful and be part of the culture that you're now introducing to Gen Z. And if you're one of Levy's fans, like go out and check out some jazz at like an all ages venue. I know there's a lot of video game jam sessions that are popping up right now. Could also go to a concert that's decidedly not jazz. Uh, my band Sungazer is going on tour this fall. Our band is gonna have Josh Didla Victoria on guitar, the amazing prog fusion guitar player, as well as Jared Yee on tenor sax, at least for the October dates that we're playing on the West Coast. We're gonna be playing four nights in San Francisco. We're gonna be playing in LA, playing in Denver, Dallas, Austin, and Houston. And we're gonna be joined on that Denver and those Texas dates by Everything Yes, featuring of course, Zach Grooves. Yeah, that's Zach Grooves. We're gonna be playing, it's gonna be fun. There's gonna be a lot of notes come out and hang. In November, we're gonna be playing in Europe. The dates are listed on the screen right here. We're gonna be joined by Pierre Luigi Salami on keys and also Jared Yee on saxophone. And in December, we're doing an East Coast of North America tour. Dates are on the screen. And we're gonna be joined by Siren Tip, who's an amazing artist. I think if you enjoy Sungazer's music, you'll really dig Siren Tip's music as well. So come out and hang, watch us play jazz fusion at you. Uh, we'll be hanging out after most of the shows. So, um, yeah, until next time, everybody. Peace.